Thank you, Brother Paul. His arms are opened wide. And walk through mercy's door. Isn't that a great thought? And there you'll find the grace of God. Thank God for His grace. If you've ever been hurting, in need, just navigating life, man, how we need God's grace. Well, we're so glad each of you are here today. God bless you for being in the Lord's house today for our church family. It's always good to have us here together. And for the many guests that are with us today, God bless you for being here this morning. We're really honored to have you with us. I trust I'll have a chance to meet you. I've tried to get around most of the church and meet the folks who are here for the first time or second time. We're always very grateful to have people at Eastland Baptist Church for the very first time. This is a neat place, a pretty special place. Uh, we're not a perfect group of people, but we're a happy group of people. And uh, God's been good to us here. We're always grateful for God to extend and enlarge our church family. And to have folks visit us for the very first time. And we're glad to have each of you here. Last week was kind of a new beginning for us in terms of the year. That was just the first of the calendar year. But we unveil each year a new theme, an area of focus uh, that we want to work on as a church family. And last week we unveiled a, a theme with a singular word. And that was the word together. Just working at being together as a church family. God has blessed Eastland Baptist Church, and we've been able to grow. New people have been added to the church. And as we've grown larger, we want to also grow smaller by relationships within the church. And I'm encouraging you to get to know each other in a greater way, to spend time with each other. Uh, for those of you who don't sit, sit on this side of the auditorium, to sit on that side and meet the people there. Now, that only works if not everybody moves. Because then it's just the same group of people on the outside of the auditorium, and that's kind of what happened. And last week, I'm not sure who I was talking to, somebody who stood over here. I, I believe it was Brother Science who said, now here's what's going to happen. Everyone's going to move, and so another group of people are going to come over on my side, so I'll meet new people. The problem was is everyone in his section had that same idea. And so they just sit there and greet each other. But the idea of together is an important word in the Bible. We find it over 500 times. God's plan and design for His people are to be knit together. Relationship, community, these are very important things. And I want to talk to you about that thought again this morning. If you'd stand with me to the book of Proverbs, and look at me in chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27. A topical thought today. In time, we'll get into another expository study. But for right now, some topical thoughts on the idea of togetherness. And this morning, and probably again tonight, I want to talk to you about being together as friends. Just being together as friends. Most of you would know this particular verse, and I trust it will be a help to us today as we reflect on it and ask God to use it in our life. But in verse number 17 of chapter 27, the Bible says, Iron sharpeneth iron. If you've ever had a knife, you know about swords, that you use metal to sharpen metal. That the friction, the association between those two things will make each other sharper. If you want to sharpen a blade, you've got to use something sharp to do it with. Something that will grate against it, be in close, intimate contact with it. The Bible says, iron sharpeneth iron. And the word is so here, or likewise, a man sharpened the countenance. In the Hebrew, it literally means the word face, meaning the person. It says, so, a man sharpeneth, makes better, more useful, the countenance of his friend. Of his friend. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the friendships that we enjoy here at Eastland Baptist Church. And Lord, I pray they could grow stronger and, uh, Lord, more, more beneficial. Lord, just as iron sharpens another piece of iron... Lord, I pray that our interaction with each other as friends would make us better because of that interaction. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you so much for standing this morning. Thank you for honoring God that way. And you may be seated. One of the points that I'm endeavoring to make and will continue to endeavor to make in the coming weeks is focusing on this idea of together, relationship, community, uh, being better because of being together. I believe that it is in the heart and mind of God, and I could prove that from the Word of God, that God's design for us, especially His children, is for us to be together. 
The Bible speaks of this in Philippians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 4, the book of 1 Corinthians, the book of Thessalonians, a bunch of different places that God's designed for us is to be together as one man in one mind with one spirit striving together for the faith of the gospel. God knows that the way He's designed us, there is strength and unity, there is resilience and harmony, and there is benefit in being together. This text we're reading this morning, along with a host of others, suggests to us that for you and me to be our best, for you and me to grow as we ought to be, for you and I to be the person that God wants us to, to be, is that we cannot do that in isolation. That we cannot do that apart from a community of believers, and especially we can't become the person we're supposed to without the association of an intimate relationship that we called friendship. Friendship. God's design for us as communal beings made in the image and likeness of God who exist in a trinity, a plurality of persons for association and fellowship, we're just like Him. We too need the company of others. In profound wisdom and great simplicity, Solomon here emphatically states, he says this in the book of Ecclesiastes, two are better than one. Now, it's hard to miss the point there, isn't it? That two are better than one. And then he goes on to give three primary reasons that that is so. But the, the simple principle is this, that you and I are better. We stand stronger. We're more courageous. We, we can do more for God. We're stronger in life when we are bound tightly with someone else. There is a synergistic combination that comes together when God's people are together in heart, spirit, and mind. I would suggest that one of the benefits of being together is a greater reward. It, it makes sense that two can do more than one. We can accomplish something greater, bigger. We can literally lift things that are more heavy when people work together. Is a reward in working together. But the reward of togetherness is that it also makes us better people. And that's the thought I want to drive home today. The text in Proverbs 27 makes that emphatically clear. If you take a piece of iron and you rub it with another piece of iron, it sharpens it. Well, what's that mean? It's more useful. A sharpened knife, a sharpened sword accomplishes its mission better. It's, it's what it's supposed to be, a sharp knife, a sharp sword. It cuts better. It's more effective. It's, it's what it's intended to be. A dull sword, a dull knife does not navigate its purpose very well. Does that make sense? If that is so, and the Bible uses the word so, or in like manner, in order for you and I to be everything that we're supposed to be, we need the sharpening, the improvement, the, the help that comes in having another close association called friendship. Without community, without relationship, without friendship, without meeting together, we become impoverished in some way. We're poorer for it than God intended for us to be. I've said this several times already, but I want us to focus on it again today that the theme of together is not because I looked at an Eastland Baptist Church and saw some schism or some problem that somehow we're not together, but rather we're focused on together because of its potential for good. That to the degree that we come together, that to the degree that we associate together, to the degree that we sharpen one another properly, that there's more possibility, there's more potential, it, it improves all of us. In being together. Two are better than one. As we consider this text this morning from the book of Proverbs, chapter 27, verse 17, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the face of the countenance of his friend. We see that truth again. I want to focus on it. Friendship with a person who loves the Lord. Friendship with a godly person. Friendship who is, with someone who is striving down the same path that you are will make you a more useful better person for others and to God. It is God's design in great measure, and I want you to think about this, to use other people to improve our lives. God the Father speaks to us. He works in our lives in an amazing way. He sends the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit intercedes and works, and as the paraclete comes alongside us and, and helps us make the right decisions. Jesus Christ is an ever-present help in our time of need. We, we have the Word of God that we can read and, and be improved by. We can get on our knees and pray to the Heavenly Father, but God, with these means of grace and others, He still wants to use people 
to improve us. Some inspire us. Some encourage us. Some lead us. Some teach us. From some we may learn from their negative example of, the, of what not to do. But God wants us to learn from people. A preacher standing in the pulpit is not there for position or place. He's there to help God's people. The teacher who stands in the classroom is a person. and He's not there for position or place, but he's there to help God's people. A mom and dad are there to help their children. Children are supposed to help their mom and dads. And friends in the church are supposed to help each other. God uses people to sharpen his people. As iron sharpeneth iron. God wants our, our activity, our interaction together to be positive, right, and good. And I'll speak to this at some length tonight. But He wants us to make each other better people, sharper for being associated together. And, and today, I, I, this is a simple sermon with some very simple thoughts. I want to suggest to you first this morning that friendship, friendship is important. I want you just to think about that with me for a moment. Friendship is important. It's important for the obvious reason that I just read, but friendship is important. Somehow, I think in Western culture especially, that because we emphasize individualism so much, I can do it, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get this done, and we have this pioneering spirit, and and that's not a negative thing, but somehow I think... And having that so much a part of who we are, we forget that we still really need other people around us. We still need friendship. We still need relationship. We, we, I think we believe some, for some reason that friendship is uh, maybe optional. I don't have time for that right now. I don't have time to invest in you. I don't have time to give myself to, this, to these people. And, and I think we have this idea, I can, I can make it alone. And maybe you can. But the question is, how are you making it? How are you making it? The fact is, you and I can navigate life to some degree with some diminished quality without friendships, relationships, but we could do it a lot better if we'd invest in other people and allow them to invest in us. Jesus, who is to be our example in every area of life, highly valued friendship. Matter of fact, he made it a virtue. One of the most endearing qualities about Jesus is that people looked at him. And in two different places in scriptures, outside observers looked at Christ and said this about him. Well, that guy, and they meant this negative, but it wasn't negative. He was a friend of publicans and sinners. Who who was Jesus? What did he do? Well, he did miracles. Well, who was Jesus? What did he do? Well, he's God. He he is deity. Uh, Who was Jesus? What did he do? Well, man, he did all these amazing things. But who is Jesus? If you take this statement and you simplify it to its elementary level, here's what it said about Jesus. Jesus was a friend. We focus on the object of his friendship. Oh, he was a friend of sinners and publicans. But you can stop short of that and still have a great truth there. Look here. Jesus, for all that he was and all that he did, Jesus was a friend. He was on the most epic mission of mankind, the salvation of the world. I've got big important things to do. I've got to go from point A to point B. I don't have time for a a lot of stuff. That's our attitude. Here's the Savior of the world. What was noted about him? He was a friend. He had time for people. He saw it as important. Jesus was on a trip, and the message came to him that the man named Lazarus has died. And Jesus looked at his disciples, he says, Our friend has died. Our friend has died. Mary and Martha were friends, Lazarus was his friend. And certainly the twelve was his friends as well. Brother Daniel and I were talking this week about this thought of togetherness and friendship. And I just read this thought, and I'm not kidding, an hour later Daniel walks to my office and says, Preacher, I just noticed something. Here's this text about Jesus and the disciples, and, and 
and this isn't necessarily pertinent to the story, it seems, but Jesus always made the point of saying that the disciples were with him. With him. Jesus was with people. It's just a fascinating thought to me that the Savior of the world made it really clear that friendship was important. God in the creation, he he just speaks this in in, in loud course, to be alone is not good. God made this amazing world. It's all perfect. It's It's all good. And he looks at every part of it. This is good. This is good. This is good. And then he makes man in perfect, and he's perfect the perfect physical spiritual man. And he looks at him, and after pronouncing all these things good, he looks at Adam and says, uh, this is not good. Well, what's not good about Adam, Lord? He's alone. And I didn't make man to be alone. So God made a help me. Listen, whatever else Eve was, companion, wife, she was this, she was friend. She was friend. And all through the Bible, God put people together. Elijah, Elisha, Paul, and Silas, uh, James, Andrew, Peter. All these men worked together as friends. Listen, the empirical data now supports what the Bible said long, long ago. Uh, Social science is now saying, listen, to be alone without a friend, it's not good. Did you know that if you have meaningful relationships in your life, you'll most likely live longer? Did you know that if you have meaningful relationships, friendships, you'll probably be more healthy? I don't remember what I said a couple weeks ago. It's better to eat french fries with a friend than eat broccoli alone. (laughs) You throw whatever junk food you want in there. I love the justification of that. I, I love that. You know, you'll enjoy life more if you're not alone. My wife will see a sunset. Here's what she does. You know, she, she appreciates the beauty of it. And here's what we all do. Hey, Troy, come look at this. There's just something enriching about looking at it together. Let's go for a drive. But you don't want to go for a drive alone. You want to go with somebody. Built that way. It's important. It's, it's part of who we are. You'll be happier in a relationship. You'll be less prone to addiction, depression, and antisocial behavior if you develop friendships. But here's the thing. The opposite is also true. You don't allow God to use you to invest in other people and let them invest in you, and you're without friendships, and you're liable to live less long, to be less happy. You'll not enjoy life as much. We experience loneliness. Listen, friendship is important because it makes us better, sharpens us. Now, another truth I want you to see this morning is this is, though that's true, real friendship is something that few of us enjoy. Real friendship. I'm talking about the word friend in the Bible means close association. Um, There's a friend, the Bible says, that sticketh closer than a brother. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about friendship. Someone who sticks close by. Someone who's there for you. You're there for them. You experience life together. You laugh. You share. You cry. It's a curious thing, isn't it? That something we so desperately need that we're hardwired for, we often choose to live without, or at least marginalize. I believe that's a relatively modern phenomenon, living in a crowded world alone. Living in a crowded world alone. Going to a church alone. Sitting in a class alone. Going to work alone. Don't raise your hands, but man, can you identify with that? Study after study suggests that people don't have friends like they used to. We have acquaintances, people we know, We say, hi, hello, how are you doing? We express courtesy to one another. We can talk socially at some level. We fellowship at church, kind of. We don't have friends. 
Again, the Greek means dear one, close one. The question begs itself, doesn't it? Why not? Why wouldn't I have a friend? Now, here's where I, I get really good. I'm, I'm really good at stating the obvious. Why don't we have friends? And the answer is, is because we make no provision for them. We make no provision for them. If a man would have friends, then there's a rest of that verse, isn't there? Then he must show himself what? If you want to have friends, if you want to have a relationship, then you have to do something about it. You have to be proactive. You have to show yourself friendly. We make no provision for it. Now, that's, that's crazy because in, in a thousand years of life, we make provision for the things that we need. We need food. You don't live without food. You don't function well without food. So we make provision for food. We get a job and we go work. If we're sick, we make provision to go get medicine. If we want to succeed in something, we make provision for an education. But we need friendship. We need relationship. We're made for it. We make relatively no provision for it. We hope for it. We desire it. We want it. We don't make provision for it. I thought, why don't we? Well, we're busy. Is there anybody here not busy? And you just got a downgrade in life. You just you just got all the free time you want. Man, we're busy. We have no time for um, friendship, and, and friendship is kind of time intensive. You, you don't schedule friendship. I'll be your friend for the next ten minutes. Let's schedule lunch and be friends for a little bit. Now, friendship grows um, arm in arm, walking together, crying together, laughing together. Look here, just being together. We're so busy, we can't do that. Everyone here knows what time it is right now. And this should be one of the highlights of the day when we're together, but we're all next thing to do. One of the reasons Western culture doesn't have time for friendship is because we, we no longer linger. You know, I want to get these LL buttons, linger longer. It, it, it just, you know, just to be, to, to get up out of the pew and then, you know, I'm not saying don't move towards your car. We want you to go home sometime. <laughs> but, I mean, it doesn't have to be like a military march. Linger. And I'm not just talking about here in the church. I mean in life. You, dads come home from work and you're tired to wear out and you just, you know what, this is something that I, do, I need to be better at. It's just coming in the living room and just, okay, here I am, kids. What do you want, Dad? I don't want anything. I'm just here. I'm lingering. I'm lingering. Just, I'm here. What do I want to talk about? I don't care. Just Relaxing. Most of you can't relax anymore. What's next? What time does it come on the TV? What are we doing? What, yada, 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 yada. And we're destroying relationship because of it. We live in the same house, sometimes in the same room. But we don't relax. We don't rest. We don't linger and just talk. We're too busy for that. You know, I think about Mary and Martha there. Jesus is in the house. And there, were, and there was things to do, but Mary could just come in and she just lingered at Jesus' feet. She just rested there. And she was enriched for it. And Martha's like doing this and Martha's doing this. Now, which one of those two was poor and which one of those two was richer? The one who relaxed and lingered or the one who was just doing, doing, doing? I'm not against doing. We've got to find a time to rest and to linger. So, listen, somewhere along life's way, Please listen to me. Somewhere along life's way, we started measuring success in terms of achievement and accomplishment rather than in relationship. Now, that's a truth you've got to grab a hold of. Somewhere along life's journey, we, we got this notion. I've got to get this job that makes this much money and get these things done. And I'm not against that. But where did we get off thinking that that was the measure of success rather than the man who related to his children, had a relationship with his wife, had a relationship with friends, and was rich in friendships? 
Listen, you can have $100,000 in your bank account and be impoverished in spirit. When you die one day, what do you want to be rich in? I'm leaving behind a big house. I'm not against it. That's not my point. But man, be rich in people. Friend, you, know, you, you, come, uh, you come to church and you serve. That's great. Thank you. We need your help. But don't just come and serve. Come and relate to people. Be anxious to come and, and greet friendships, people. Not just production, not just accomplishment, not just achievement. And then very quickly, I think the third reason we don't have um, friendships, and here's, here's a, an incredible oxymoron, is because sometimes they hurt. Anybody here ever been hurt by a friend before? That yeah, stinks. It stinks. The greatest hurt I've ever experienced in ministry is not a bad sermon. And there's times I want to come and just hide. You know, that, that hurts. Or not the failure of some plan or scheme or budget or whatever else. It's when somebody I really loved hurt me. Or I knew I hurt them. And you know when we get, we get gun shy? But you know, the day you stop being vulnerable is the day you, you just you live a plastic, cheap life. Loving people's risky business. But it's better than not loving. It's better to love and be hurt than not to know what love's about. Not to know what friendship is about. We are sinful creatures who hurt one another, but I'm telling you, it's still worth the risk. We need uh, to overcome these things. And number three, and I'll be finished. This is the point of the sermon. Friendship, togetherness, building community, especially in the church, is something that we need to give attention to. Friendship is something that we can improve on as a church, as an individual, as a person, in your home, at work. Friendship is something that you and I need to give greater attention to. In the friendship that we build, we'll be sharper for it. Someone else will be sharper for it. We'll be better for it, stronger for it. We'll we'll learn more from someone else. Again, we'll talk about some of these things tonight. And if that is true, then there is something that is something that is worthy of our deliberate time, attention, and effort. As Christians, you and I give deliberate effort to a great number of things. For some of you, you give great attention to holiness, eschewing evil, living right. That's a great thing to give attention to. You give great attention to Bible reading, and God bless you, it will change your life. You give great attention to prayer. You give a, a great attention to a number, a number of, of Christian virtues. But remember, Jesus was a friend. And if you want to be a true child of God, maybe you should give some attention to relationships as well. Helping someone and letting them help you. I, I posed this question to myself um, this week. Now, I want you to really bear down and think about this with me. I was reading a book, and and this question was actually posed there. It went like this. If I was to die, Troy was to die today, you lay me in the grave there, how many people there would be more than just observers and participants, and how many people there would be active mourners, deeply hurt? Now, all of you might... Well, a lot of you wouldn't cry, but some of you might cry. But, it, yeah, that's just, we're cupping the emotion. I'm talking about how many people, I'm not talking about my family, how many people be active mourners? Because that's probably your friends. The happy few, whatever you want to call it. Let me ask you this question. Maybe it's easier if you reverse it. How many, what person, if they died, would, would you go to their funeral, not out of courtesy, not because you're in the same church, not because you have some affection for them, but whose funeral would you be an active, engaged mourner in? And you really bear down and think about that. And I'm excluding family. That number's probably really small. And the question I have for us is this. Is that the way you want to live and die? I'm not saying, oh, you go, he's a good guy. I get that. 
a hip lot of people, or sorry he's gone. I'm talking about there's loss, devastation, because this person's gone. It's an interesting question for evaluation. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever done this? You may do it today. I'm walking by. I say, hey, Brother Dawson. Good to see you today. Yes, good to see you too, Pastor. We need to get together sometime. Yeah, we sure do. Let's do lunch sometime. Yeah, let's do lunch sometime. Have a great day. Have a great day. And then the lunch never comes. Anybody ever done that? Man, I need to have you over sometime. We sure do. Enjoy that. Good to see you. Boy, we need to get together. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. And we never do it. Now, I can say this. Brother Bill and I had lunch last week together, and we even invited Brother Stiles. Actually, he invited me. All the Brother Stiles is good once a month or so. He invites me to lunch. I don't know why, but he does. It's because you buy, brother. That's why. <laughs> now, here's the question. Why do we say that? Well, we know we need to. It's important. But the thing is, we don't do it. I'm not getting on you for saying it. I'm simply suggesting that maybe when you said that person, maybe when you get together sometime, that maybe in their heart they're going, man, I'd really enjoy that. I'd enjoy that fellowship. When I'm really lonely. That'd be a great thing to do. And then you don't do it. And it's almost become, well, I really don't expect that person to follow through. I just think we live there sometimes. So what do we do? How do we overcome busyness and hurt and TV time? Well, as I've already said, I think we just need to slow down a little bit, make time for relationship, linger longer. We'll make this a joke before long, but it's okay. It's something that we need to do. And I'm not implying to stay in the foyer here forever. I'm saying go home and enjoy your kids. I'm saying go home and just relax at lunch. Stop looking at the clock. I'm saying this, eliminate enough in your schedule so that you can relax to build friendship. Our lives are so scheduled, so driven, so defined by work and goals, achievement, production, and these aren't bad things, but those are not conducive elements to friendship. Friendship takes time. It's hard to schedule. Hurried, flurried people aren't good friends. And number two, how about this? This is profound. Learn to just enjoy people. Learn, look up here at me a second. Learn to just enjoy people. Don't judge them. Don't be critical. Stop evaluating them. Don't look at them as objects to be fixed. Just enjoy them. He's quirky. Okay, enjoy his quirkiness. He's a weirdo. It's okay, you are too. Quit looking at people as problems to be solved, appointments to be scheduled, lunches to have. Just enjoy them for whoever and whatever they are. Yeah, I just God just so convicts me this week. I'm counseling this one. I'm helping that one. I'm fixing this one. I'm leading, guiding, organizing, strategizing. You know what I like to do? Is just talk. I've learned this leadership is really lonely because all you do is you, you look at people's these quantifiable objects. I've got to get this many here and this many there and have this meeting and fix this one again and counsel this one. And, and, and you've got to do those things. But I, I, I just wouldn't mind talking about a football game, my life, your life, whatever. And I, I'm not on anybody here. I'm talking about just all of us are like that, aren't we? I've got to make this phone call, get this person done, have these people over. How about this? Just enjoy whoever God brings across your path. Enjoy people. We need to do a much better job at that. I want to encourage you today just to think these thoughts through. Friendship is important. It's worthy of your time. Friendship, it's important. And you probably don't have as many as you could use. And I can promise you this. If you do, someone else doesn't. Maybe you've got all that you need. And if you do, God bless you. But Joe, Susie, Bob, Mary over here, maybe not. 
And maybe you reaching out to them just might be part of saving their life. Or at least this, improving the quality of their life. And then let's do this. Let's do this. Let's get together sometime. And then do it. Jesus was a friend. He had time for people. And if our great example can do that, then my friend, you can too. Let me ask you to stand. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Word of God. Lord, as iron sharpeneth iron, Lord, we've been called upon to sharpen, help, improve, to enrich someone else's life as well. Lord, I pray you'd help me to be a better friend. Lord, I pray you'd enlarge my circle of friendships and relationships. And Lord, for everyone here, I pray you'd do the same for them. Lord, I pray you'd make people rich. Lord, not just monetarily, but Lord, relationally as well. Lord, if we're together as a church family, we're going to sharpen one another. We're going to be better for it. And so, Lord, we ask for your help. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We're going to sing this verse of invitation this morning. I'm not sure how to help you make the application there, but I'd say this. Maybe you want to come and say, Lord, I, I, I'm going to work at friendships. I'm going to work at relationships. Lord, I'm going to make part of my Christian life building connections with people better. That'd be a great reason to come. Just tell the Lord, I, I'm going to work on that. I'm going to improve in that area of my life. You may be saying, I, I'm set in that area. Well, maybe somebody else is not. Maybe you just need to come and say, I'll, I'm going to be a friend to whoever needs it. I know some people here have been busy for some time. Um, you might want to come for membership today. Being part of a band of brothers isn't a bad thing, and a church is a great place to start. We'd love to have you. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You don't know that friend that sticks closer than a brother. Do we have men and ladies here who'd like to lead you to Christ and show you how to be saved today? But whatever the need may be, maybe totally unrelated. But if you need to spend time with the Lord this morning, then you come as we sing. Brother Jesse. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our you come this morning as we sing. We won't tarry long. If you need to come, we encourage you to come this morning. What a privilege to care.